two events colored the way that I look at religious freedom today. One was in November 1989, I was walking through a wall. The wall was in Berlin. It was the fall of the Berlin Wall, something no one expected, and really the collapse of global communism. People assumed that the communist regimes would last as long as we would live. That showed that governments and these restrictive powers of governments are possible to fall. The other event that colored how I think about religious freedom is the events that happened on September 11, 2001. I was working in the Middle East in a city that had 20,000 people from Afghanistan, Taliban, working there. The events of 9-11 made it clear that it's not just governments that can affect the situation for religious freedom, but groups in society. So I'd like to now give you a glow, the state of religious freedom around the world in statistics, and then end with some hopeful news. So restrictions, as I've mentioned, on religious freedom can come from two main sources, the actions of governments and groups in society. A study I've been leading for more than a decade has found that today about 40% of the world's countries have high or very high restrictions on religious freedom coming from governments or from groups in society. But because several of these countries are very populous, 78.5% or 5.9 billion people live in countries with high or very high restrictions. That's a marked increase over the course of the study that was done at the Pew Research Center. In 2009, when, Pew, when I began the study at Pew, only 4.8 billion people lived in countries with high restrictions. Today, almost 6 billion people live in countries. That's a 1.1 billion increase of the number of people living in countries. So the situation and challenges for religious freedom are being felt more keenly by people all around the world. The research uh, is a careful look at multiple uh, reports and sources of information, some coming from the US government, the United Nations, independent watchdogs like Human Rights Watch. And we count up and categorize each government restriction on religion and each social hostility involving religion and then add them up into indexes so that we can monitor the state of religion, religious freedom in the world. So what do I mean when I say a government restriction on religion and a social hostility involving religion? Well, for instance, in Pakistan, blasphemy, that's saying something or doing something uh, that is critical of God or the divine, that's against the law, that's a capital offense. You can be put in jail and put to death for blasphemy. That's a government restriction. However, when recently, uh, several politicians were killed because they wanted to change these laws. They were assassinated, and there have been ongoing demonstrations in Pakistan supporting these blasphemy laws. Those are social hostilities involving religion, and the two often are connected, one leading to the other. Another example in, in France, the burqa has been banned. That's a government restriction on religious freedom. And then recently there have been a spat of religion-related terrorist attacks in France, those are social hostilities involving religion. Another example, in India, there are numerous states that have laws protecting uh, the sacredness of cows, and you cannot sell or eat beef. Well, those are government restrictions. But then when people in society kill those who are raising cows or eating cows, those are social hostilities involving religion. Government restrictions on religious freedom, occur, high government restrictions are, occur in about 25% of the world's countries. So that makes about 60% of the world's people living in countries with high government restrictions on religious freedom. Now these restrictions have been rising. Government harassment or intimidation has been on the rise. 
In 20, 2007, 118 countries had reports of governments harassing or intimidating people of faith. For instance, in China, there's a recent campaign to remove crosses from the tops of churches in a number of Chinese provinces. Today, 157 countries report having government harassment or intimidation. That's an increase of 39 countries over the course of the study. Government use of physical force, and this can happen and uh, has, uh, has showed marked increase. For instance, even in France, uh, during the refugee crisis at Calais, uh, the French government bulldozed several uh, impromptu churches and mosques to the ground, use of physical force. Government interference with worship has been on the rise, increasing around the world. For instance, the recent ban on Jehovah Witnesses was preceded by uh, security forces entering and intimidating uh, Jehovah Witnesses during their worship services. Government regulation of religious symbols even happens uh, right here in the United States. This young woman uh, was a Muslim in uh, the state of California who was pulled over for a traffic violation and they saw she had some outstanding uh, other violations so they put her in jail for the night and the policeman made her remove her hijab or her head covering in front of other men and threw her into her cell with other men. So that was found by the equal, uh, that was found by the Department of Justice to be a violation of her rights and the uh, police in California have been fined uh, for their actions. Social restrictions on religious freedom are high in about a, a quarter of the world's countries, but because country, several of the countries are populous, about 54% of people live with high social hostilities involving religion. Uh, for instance, uh, there's been a rise in the number of countries where people are assaulted for offending the majority faith. For instance, in uh, Myanmar or Buddha, uh, Burma, there have been an ongoing campaign by Buddhists against Rohingya Muslims and others. There have been coercive enforcement of religious norms. Uh, for instance, in India, five of its 28 states have anti-conversion laws, which are uh, meant to uh, protect people from being paid to convert. But in practice, these laws often incite violence and people use the laws to accuse neighbors and others of actions. And uh, this enforcement of religious norms has been on the rise. Women being harassed over uh, religious dress is on the rise, showing a significant increase. For instance, one of the leading newscasters in Iran, who is a strong proponent of wearing the veil, went on a picnic with her family and was photographed uh, without her veil in a private park. Um, and then this aroused tremendous social uh, backlash, including on social media, uh, against her. Mob violence related to religion unfortunately also happens here at home. Last week in Charlottesville, uh, we saw white supremacists and many chanting anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish slogans uh, uh, marching in the streets of Charlottesville. And many of them have a, not only a white nationalistic, but a sort of very strong religious perspective with crosses being one of their main symbols. Religion-related terror and the brutal tactics of ISIS are uh, occurring in a larger number of countries. Uh, and th this is a, uh, despite the efforts of the war on terror for the past more than a decade, we still see an increase. Now, some good news, 83% of countries uh, have some initiatives to reduce religious restrictions or hostilities. Uh, one of those was led by former Secretary General Ban Ki-moon setting up a, uh, a platform called Business for Peace within the United Nations Global Compact. For example, 56% of countries have interfaith initiatives. One of those initiatives coming from the Secretary General's initiative is awards, the Global Business and Interfaith Peace Awards, which will occur in Seoul, Korea, uh, during the, this coming Olympics. These were held, uh, the inaugural awards were held during the Rio Olympics last year. And here are the stories, very briefly, 
the stories of 12 business leaders who were honored during the awards for trying to promote religious freedom, interfaith understanding, or peace. And this will be a topic I'll talk about in an afternoon session more, but here are their stories. In Brazil, Jonathan Berezovsky economically empowers and integrates immigrants into society. Aziz Abdusera and Scott Cooper of Medji Tours encourage peace and cultural understanding through their dual narrative tours. Frank Fredericks led a joint effort to spread awareness for a worldwide diversity campaign. Kathy Island continuously supports initiatives to advance and defend religious freedom worldwide. Y.W. Junadi hosts mass weddings that allow thousands of Indonesian families to gain legal status in their country. Don Larson is working to reverse the trend of broken families and hopeless poverty in Mozambique. Fuad Maksumi is empowering Lebanese youth to establish businesses and receive vocational training. Bruce McKeever facilitates religious tolerance and understanding in business. Baroness Nicholson is helping displaced Iraqi women to cope with the atrocities of war. Abdo Ibrahim El Tassi gives immigrants in Canada a jump start through training and interest-free loans. Taiba Taylor was a tireless voice for Muslim women across the world. Brittany Underwood empowers mothers in Uganda to provide for their families. Thirty-eight percent of countries today have initiatives to combat religious discrimination. Uh, this young woman was not hired by the clothing retailer Abercrombie & Fitch in the United States. Her case was taken up by the Equal uh, Employment Opportunities Commission and they, com they took Abercrombie & Fitch to court and this court case eventually made its way to the uh, Supreme Court. The company Abercrombie & Fitch was found guilty of religious discrimination. Uh, they didn't hire her because she was wearing a hijab. So this is uh, an example of uh, initiatives to combat religious discrimination, having a government agency to pursue these, courses, these cases. 20% of countries have educational and training initiatives to promote interfaith understanding and religious freedom. One that has just come out this year is from the international consulting firm Ernst & Young, EY. They've developed a course uh, called Religious Literacy for organization, Organizations, which they're promoting worldwide for companies to learn how to better uh, handle religious issues positively for business success within the workplace. And finally, 15% of countries have had land or property initiatives trying to restore old properties that were confiscated either through past wars or conflicts. For instance, recently in Palermo in uh, um, Sicily, uh, a, uh, a Jewish synagogue that was uh, taken over um, many decades ago was returned to the Jewish community and the archbishop who was uh, behind that initiative was given an award by the Israeli government. So religious freedom, I'll conclude, religious freedom, as was mentioned this morning, uh, is highly correlated with other positive outcomes. For instance, where you have religious freedom, you have more resources in action to combat poverty because religious uh, groups and uh, actors are often involved in poverty reduction. Second, religious freedom results in better lives for women. Where you have religious freedom, you have more options for women to participate, and uh, you tend to have a much more open society. Uh, so religious freedom is highly correlated with strategic development goal five, empowering women. And most importantly, it's uh, correlated with empower, uh, strategic development goal 16, which is uh, peaceful and just societies. If you'd like to see more research on religious freedom and its connection to positive uh, outcomes for society, you can find it at my foundation's website, religiousfreedomandbusiness.org 
backslash research. Thank you.